This morning we conclude our summer teaching series called Who He Is. We've been looking at the attributes or the nature and the character of God. And there's a reason why we've been doing this this summer is because I believe we're going into a turmoil, challenging time in America. And God's people have got to know who God is because we have to put our trust in him. And he's faithful and he's good. But if we're wavering on is God good or is he faithful or is he going to meet all of our needs, we can get, kind of get lost. And so we've been taking the summer to talk about who God is. Joni Erickson Tata said, if you're hurting or confused, find one of God's great attributes. If you want to grow in the Lord, learn about who God is and invite him to come close into your heart. So this is what we talked about this summer. God is holy. He's loving. He's faithful, omnipotent. He's eternal. He's changeless. Last week, Pastor Mel talked about God is omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. This morning, I want to talk to you that God is omnipresent. Omni means all, obviously present. So God is all present. He's everywhere at the same time. And I thank God that God is omnipresent, that we can reach out to him at any time and at any place. This past week, my immediate family, my daughters and their husbands, these were the states that we were in. The Wegner family were in Kansas, Mexico, Utah, Missouri, and this third world country, New Jersey. Come on, somebody. That our family was spread out. But the Bible teaches us that God is everywhere. It's hard for us to understand that. So let's say you go out to eat today. Let's say you stop at Five Guys. And while you're at Five Guys, you can't be at Shake Shack at the same time. You can only be at one place at one time. Even maybe it's summertime and maybe someone's at the shore. It's supposed to be 85 and I get it. We pray that there's sharks in the water. You feel convicted of not being in, in church, but that's a whole nother thing. But you can't be in church and the shore at the same time. You can't be in kids' ministry and the church sanctuary at the same time. So it's hard for us to understand that God can be in all places equally at the same time. It's also true that Satan can't be in all places at the same time. Sometimes we think that Satan is just as powerful as God and we kind of choose between the two. But Satan can only be at one place at one time. And the reason behind that is because the Bible says that God is spirit. He can be at every place, at every time, equally across the world. The Bible says it like this, Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I get in an airplane, 30,000 feet, you could pray, you can call in the name of the Lord, and God is there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. Go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. The Bible says God is there. If I rise on the wings of dawn, if I settle on the far side of sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Now, as a believer in Jesus Christ, as you follow Christ, it's different than any other world religion. Most world religions say that there is a focal point or a highlight point of somewhere you have to go at least once in your lifetime. For some, they have to go to Saudi Arabia and they do a journey like once in their life and that's a spiritual experience and that's where you should go. Other people might go to a temple or they might go to this place or go to this river and bathe in the river and maybe there'll be a cleansing. But the Bible teaches us that we as believers don't have to go anywhere, that God comes to us. Now, let me explain like this. I have been to Israel. I told you this, I think it's been six or seven years ago, and I had a great experience. And going to like Jerusalem and walking the very places where Jesus walked, it's phenomenal. I, I like history, and so to think that you're walking at the exact place that Jesus, and you see where Jesus died on the cross, our Savior, and by the way, Someone paid for me to go. And it does feel more spiritual when someone pays for you to go. Come on, somebody. Have you ever noticed that? But let's say you never have that opportunity to go to Israel or to go to Jerusalem. That doesn't mean that God is not with you. 
you don't get like brownie points or you don't get points in your salvation because you go to Israel, because that's where the Bible teaches us that God is spirit and he is everywhere. He is not limited by time or space. And if your theology knows, if you know that, then you can just rest assured wherever I am, I have access to the living God. This morning, I don't want to talk to you so much about theology, but practically, how you can have a relationship with God closely because you know that he is all-powerful or he's omnipotent. First, God's plan is to come close to us by his spirit. Matter of fact, you remember when Jesus came? Do you remember what they called him? Watch this. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. We don't have to journey, God came with us. And then when Jesus left, or he, the Bible says he was gonna uh, get, like die and then go up to heaven, he says, it's good that I go away so I can send the advocate, the spirit of God, that would come and be close to our hearts. Now if you have a broken heart, or you have a broken life, or a broken dream, or someone has done something wrong to you, and you might say, where is God, or where is God in it? God's om omnipresence, God's presence with us means that there is, in the midst of suffering, pain, sickness, sorrow, anger, grief, bitterness, divorce, betrayal, murder, rape, sexual abuse, cancer, AIDS, abortion, warfare, famine, earthquakes, fires, floods, every natural disaster, Accidents, personal loss, at the moment of death, the Bible says God will be with us. In the worst moments of your life, whether you feel it or not, we serve a God who is omnipresent and we can trust him even when you're at the end of your rope. I've been doing church ministry for a while and there's lots of people in and around our church at Valesburg, Newark, they feel like they're at the end of your rope. Can I just say this? If you're tired you're exhausted, you're emotionally drained, even after you serve the Lord, you just, you have no strength left. Sometimes God does his best work in your life when you have nothing to offer and God meets you at the time where you're physically, emotionally exhausted because God is omnipresent and he comes to you. So you might be like, oh, these are the things I have to do or this is what I should do and you kind of got this whole back and forth game but the Bible says that God is with us. You know this scripture. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We're not alone. God is present with us all through life's journey. God is with us. Even to the point of death, persecution, martyrdom, God is with us. I saw this meme, if you will, of a chicken at KFC. Can you see it? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil. You might feel like a chicken walking through the parking lot of KFC, but you have to know this, that God is with you. If you're a believer, God is with you. Now here, we might have two different types of people in this room. You may not be a believer. I didn't say, do you believe in God? The Bible says, yes, everyone knows there's a God. Even the demons, they believe there's a God and they shudder. They know there's like a higher being. But what I'm talking about is salvation and God living in you. And this is completely different. I didn't say, did you grow up in a Christian home or do an online course? I'm talking about God, omnipresent, comes close to a human being who invites the Lord to come into their lives. This is what 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? The Bible goes on to say you were bought at a price. Honor God with your bodies. Why? Because at salvation, something wonderful happens of closeness with you and God. First, and this is how most people, we sin. We're born in sin. We sin. We feel bad. And so what we want to do is get sin off of us. 
And so we ask Jesus to forgive us. And by the way, Jesus does forgive us. He washes us our sins. According to scripture, he forgives all your sins. Your behind, behind sins, your today sins. Like some of us, you might have already sinned today. Any hands? I'm just joking. You got sinned today. This happened to me. I have to be honest. I'm North Jersey. Sometimes I get impatient. It's slower down here. But I told you this about a year ago. I was kind of late to church, me, on Sunday morning. And there was someone driving so slow. And my flesh. Have you ever had a flesh moment? I was kind of trying to ride this guy's tail. And I did it for about a mile. I wasn't trying to. I was like, dude, just like hurry up. You know, there's just some subtle things you could do. And would you know it? That person pulled into the parking lot. I said, oh, boy. Okay. I went to another church that day. I went to St. Joan of Arc. I went to the carnival. It was great. The Lord forgives us. He forgives us yesterday. He forgives us today. And he forgives us tomorrow. That's hard for us to stand. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for all of our sins. Aren't you grateful for that? And it cleanses your conscience. If you don't allow Jesus to forgive you as a human being, and the blood of Jesus to cover you. Sin stays on you. And the Bible says the reason why it's such a big deal of sin is because all sin must be punished. Jesus died on the cross to take away our punishment, and that's what gives us peace. There's a second thing about salvation that's critical, is that if you ask the Lord to come into your heart, and this is the only way, Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life, you get to go to heaven when you die. And this is because God's great love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. The Bible says in Revelation 13, I think it's verse 8, it says, he writes our name in the Lamb's book of life. God has books. I'm so grateful today that my name is in the Lamb's book of life, aren't you? That if you would die today, your name is there. If your name is not there, you don't go to heaven. Some of you are like hustlers. You're like, oh, I'll work my way. I'll kind of I'll talk to God when I get there. I'll slip him a 20. No, God's holy. God's holy. If your name's not written in the Lamb's book of life, when you die, you do not go to heaven. This is not because God's not a loving God. It's because he is a loving God. He does what's right. He is holy. He is pure. And he has provided a way for mankind to be right with him and to satisfy his own holiness. God is angry all the time. The wrath of God is angry all the time. So on Monday night, We promote abortion publicly, and 73 million babies have, been committed, have, have died in America since Roe v. Wade. And in the auditorium, people, slap, they're just clapping. And we constantly change the terminology as if it's health. God is angry at that. He hates it, but he loves you. You can say whatever you want. Still a child in there, and he hates murder. He hates it when we use his name in vain. He hates adultery. He hates immorality. He hates transgenderism, and he loves the transgender. He hates homosexuality, and he loves the homosexual. He hates sin because of what it does in your life, and he loves to put his heart and spirit into your life. And this is what's great about salvation. He forgives us of our sin. He invites us into eternal hope with him. But maybe the greatest miracle of all is that God puts his spirit inside of us. This is what happens at salvation. When you ask Jesus into your life, it's not just for forgiveness, although it's forgiveness. It's just not eternal life. This is not God's like selling insurance, although there is insurance. It's the greatest insurance policy. If you'll die, you'll be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. We preach it. But what God does, he puts his spirit inside of us that gives us assurance that we belong to him. It's a deposit guaranteeing our soul that we belong to God. You are a child of the living God. And things change from the inside out. He transforms your life. God has always wanted to be close to your life. And inside of your heart, you cry out, Abba, Father, I belong to God. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. And every believer, if you're a believer, if you're not a believer, if you're not a believer, you should quake. 
You say, oh, I'm just doing my own thing. You can't tell me what to do. Yes. God gives you that right, that love in your heart. You can do what you want to do. But we know, you know, that will be an end time. So even if I'm misunderstood, even if I preach you sometimes get upset or whatever, you have to know we're going to stand before the God and give an account of our life. If the blood of Jesus is all over us, God doesn't see us as sinners. He sees the blood that covers over us. It's like the death angel that passes by a Passover in the Old Testament, and the blood washes over us. And as believers now with the spirit of the living God, we want everyone to know about the love of Jesus Christ. Let his spirit fill your heart today. So I have a question. Does God's spirit live inside of you? The spirit that bears witness that you're his child, is he working on you? Is he developing you from the inside out a spiritual life? Because God's plan is to come close to us by his spirit. Number two, and you say, by the way, you say, I thought Jesus was in my heart. Yes, we asked Jesus into his heart, into our heart, but really Jesus is at God's right hand throne making intercession for us. You have access to God through the person of Jesus Christ. He's the great mediator. Who comes into your heart is a spirit of the living God, and it ch changes your life because he's inside of you, leading you, glorifying Christ, lifting up the name of Jesus in your life. Number two, God's spirit is available to us at all times. We always have his full attention. We don't have to make an appointment. You have to send an email or a text He's never too busy to hear us when we pray. He's never too preoccupied with other problems. Some people look like God, like he's got glasses. By the way, God has no fault. I have glasses because I can't see well. I do have 20-20 hearing. I praise God for that. But some people think he's like, he's old, he's senile, like his beard is unkept, and he's got a big, like a big switchboard. And in Marlton, New Jersey, there's a, there's a prayer request coming, and God's like, oh my goodness, can you believe what's happening in Marlton? And then you're like, wait, and God's like, wait, hold on a second. I got bigger problems in Japan. Oh, it looks like someone needs me in Honduras. Oh, Canada. Oh, Canada. Canada. They got, and God doesn't know what to do with it. I mean, he's too busy. And then what happens is because if our theology is wrong about God being everywhere, we say, I don't want to bother God. He's got too much going on right now. Or you have a tiny theology and say, God can't handle this. The Bible says that God is everywhere all the time. You can have a relationship. You can call on the name of the Lord wherever you are. You could be in serious trouble. The Bible says if you're in trouble in James chapter 5, pray, call on the Lord. If you're happy, sing songs of praise. God is here right now. God is here. At 1045, God will be at Valesburg Assembly of God. He will be there. You say, where was God on 9-11? He was there. He was there. He was part of the cleanup. He was there. Why did that happen? Why did he stop? But that's what we don't know. We do know that man is sinful and wicked beyond cure. Their heart is beyond cure. They can't even realize. They're so into themselves. They're so sinful. They can't see past. Some people, their conscience is so bad, they promote that which is wrong, thinking that's right. That's what's happening in America right now. People are promoting, yes, go with that. And God's saying, no, but because their conscience is seared, they think they're doing something right. And so, you say, what can break that? It's only the spirit of the living God that comes and reminds us. But in our theology, we have to know that whenever we call on the name of the Lord, he is available. You're like, like you're the only person in the world. When you call on the name of the Lord, it's like, it's like God stops everything for you. And he does that for everybody who calls on the name of the Lord. Now, you might be a person, you say, I've never experienced that close intimacy. I'm here to tell you, you can. And if you're in trouble or you need God, like today, you say, my, my son, he's addicted. So many people right now, they're addicted to drugs and alcohol and cigarettes and pornography. They're loaded down with sin and confusion, anxiety, fear, and all. And Jesus says, I have an answer. Call on my name. Listen, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. America's in trouble. Our families are in trouble. Our marriage is in trouble. So what do we do? Call on the God who's omnipresent. He can help us in our trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the sea of the heart of the sea. Though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Though this kind of crazy guy, he's got an atomic bomb or 
This has got like a, a war bomb over here. Oh, what are we gonna do? And what are they teaching in a public school? And what's coming to my kid on TikTok? The Bible says, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy place where the most high dwells, God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations will uproar. That's what's happening in America. Kingdoms will fall. He lifts our voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I'm here to tell Marlton Assembly of God and Valesburg Assembly of God, although their culture is crumbling away, the Bible says God with us, and he is with us in every moment of our life. I would suggest to you he's just waiting on you to call him. He's just waiting for you to call on his name. It's not, is God available? I actually think God's like this to, human, to mankind. Call on my name. I can help you. I'll give you peace. I'll give you direction. But people are like this. There's no God. God doesn't work. I sat with a missionary this past week, mission, great young couple to Indonesia. And they're talking about in Indonesia, you have to pick one of the world religions. You have to pick Christianity, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhism. I can't remember. There was something else. Because no one's really like that's just the title. No one's like actually practicing it. A lot of people in America are that way too. I'm Catholic, but they don't really go to church. I'm Christian or Marlton, but they're not really, their heart's not there. They just say stuff. He goes, you know what they actually do? They go to the witch doctor. It's, he goes, it's next to every pharmacy. They have like a pharmacy, and then down the thing is a witch doctor. I said, I, in my ignorance, I've never been to Indonesia. I said, does that work? Like, is there power? Like, does it do something? Because everybody goes to the witch doctor for basically devil, strength, or power, or fear. It's just fear. And they say they have something like this. They have like, let's say someone gets an MRI or something. They'll say, what is that little nail inside of you? The witch doctor in its power can make a nail go into the side of somebody without blood or anything coming out. There is a false sense that there's power from other gods that leave you high and dry after the moment. But our God is present and can do the healing at any time. It's, it's a deep theology of truth that God is everywhere. Let me give you an example about missions. So as you know, there's four Assembly of God missionaries in the state of New Jersey that are leaving in 2024. And our church is sponsoring or supporting two of them. In just a minute, I'm gonna give you a, a great praise report. But we have two. One is from up Valesburg, Newark, which is just amazing, amazing that God from Newark, New Jersey is sending a young lady to go be a missionary in Mexico from our church. It's the greatest honor that we have in the life, not to go press a button on November 4th or 5th. The greatest honor in all the world is to send a missionary to go change the world for Jesus Christ. And we have another global worker missionary is going on the other side of the world. We can't tell you where she's going because she has to kind of go undercover, if you will. If we put it on social media or whatever, they would probably pull that back. Not every place is excited that Jesus Christ is coming. But this is, has to be your theology. Is the missionary taking God to Mexico? Or is God in Mexico waiting for the missionary to come? It's totally different. If I put that pressure on me as, a, as the Holy Spirit, I gotta go up to Newark and I'm bringing, I'm bringing God, I'm bringing Jesus, I'm bringing the Bible, I'm bringing the word, and I go there, I'm going there with too much pressure. Or if God calls the missionary and says, I'm already in Mexico, I'm preparing the way, let my spirit lead you and guide you. The world is waiting for us as God moves around for us to be obedient and to trust him. God is waiting for us. God is present in all places. He just does the calling by his spirit. God might put your neighbor on your heart. Maybe your coworker, your boss. He doesn't treat people right. He curses, he lies. He doesn't do the work himself. He doesn't, you're better, at, you're better at the job than he is and you're all frustrated. You come to church and Pastor John or Jesus says to you, I want you to love those in authority over you. You're like, yeah, you know, you're right. We're praying for Joe Biden, Kamala Harris. We're praying for Donald Trump, I like one of those people. I don't like the other person or whatever. But you know what? Right, they're, they're a soul. And your boss, you kind of don't respect them in the natural. 
And all of a sudden, God puts them on your heart. God puts them on your heart. And the Spirit of God is not just working on you. He's working on your boss that you don't like. If it's just you, it could actually be about you. It's never about you. It's God's Spirit that's trying to accomplish his will, and he's waiting for you to call on his name and obey whatever he says in your life. That's why. When God speaks to you, he always speaks with a sense that you must take what he just said and obey him. You can have all the facts, but if you don't obey him, he's not first in your life. The person that surrendered to the Lord, the person that surrendered to the Lord, God sees it, and that's where the spirit of God moves. I have to be honest with you, and I'm not trying to talk politics. This is something... I have a hard time watching the political landscape today because God's doing something in my heart spiritually. I've told you this two weeks ago. Because generally in America, there's tribalism. I actually think one party's policies are a little bit better than that one, but I'm trying to be fair and open and honest. But everything inside of me wants my guy to win or my gal to win. So now I don't like those people. And God's saying to me, I love those people. Yeah, but their policy, I know I, and I'm like, God's like, are you going to do something about it? What am I going to do? I'm just a local pastor in Marlton, New Jersey. But I can change your heart. So every day, I've been getting on my knees and praying for our country. And I believe God wants me to do it, and I'll tell you the reason why. Because he wants to see me in this posture of humility and completely saying, God, I need you. And I think my prayers, I'm not saying my prayers. My prayers aren't more. But is there anybody in America that's not trying to be tribal that's saying, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son? If you give your life to Christ, you don't have to join the Republicans and Democrats. You have to just choose Jesus. The world is, is so tribal. If you do this, then it's those people. And God said, I want you to reach those people. I want you to reach the lost. I want you to reach people who are your enemies. The Bible talks about, it. You, of course you can love your own. But what about the people over there? And I don't, I don't know those people, but God put those people on my heart. I don't even know them. But I got to at least try. I got to tell them about the Lord, the goodness of God. Like we could tell a dad joke. The world is so angry and frustrated and God's put it on my heart. And you say, how do you do that? It's by the spirit of the living God. But when a missionary goes, they're not taking God with them. If God is in it, if there's a calling, God is already there. He's waiting for the human, the spirit-filled person to just obey God. And God will meet you there and he will do the work. The hard part is God's always trying to tell us to obey him, and we resist what he wants to do in your life. But I am, I am here to tell you today, and I don't know if you knew, but there was a deadline of September 1st, and so it's a lot of, it's hard, first time missionaries, first time global workers going out in the field, they're not allowed to go to church to church, they have to raise money, family and friends, everybody in this church has been very generous and kind, same thing with Melissa, she's an urban environment, raising money, I'm here to tell you this morning, that Kate, I'm sorry I didn't mean to say your name, Kate and Melissa are fully funded and they're going on the mission trip, mission field in September. Kate, stand, come on, come on, we're ready to go. God bless you, Kate. As soon as we find the, 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 the exact date, we'll pray for you. But this is a miracle. It's a miracle. And I think about America, we're the wealthiest country in the world by far, and how much Americans waste how much money we waste. Shouldn't we be putting our resources into helping young people go around the world because God is calling us in Jesus' name? There's a third thing I'd like you to see this morning. God wants to do a greater work in our lives by the Spirit in this new year. If you've been around here, you know the new year is in September, not January. It's a new school year. It's when everything kicks back up, all the programming, everything. Jesus said this about what's to come and greater. He said, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. 
and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Let me repeat that. You can ask for anything in my name and Jesus will do it. If you are in his will, you will have answered prayer. So what you and I have to do is say, God, I wanna be in your will. I want answered prayer. I wanna see miracles in and through me. I want ministry. I want people to come to know the Lord. But you just can't do your own thing. Actually, bend your knee in humility and say, Lord, I'm yours. I surrender all, all to Jesus. I give my whole life. Whatever you wanna do in my life is fully surrendered. My mind, my money, my time, my past, my sexuality, it's all yours. You don't get to choose. It's all his. Everything is his. And what you simply do is say, Jesus, my whole life belongs to you. You'll be in God's will and you'll see God working in your life. You say, I never see miracles. What you probably have to do is just get into God's will. You probably just have to say yes to the Lord. And let me just give you some specifics. First, if you want to see God move by his spirit in your life, you must ask. Ask, ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For anyone who asks, receives. And whoever seeks, finds. And the door that's knocked upon, the door will be open. And that's when God moves. It's when people begin to ask God, God, would you move upon my life, on this church, in the state of New Jersey? Would you move upon the White House and America? Would you touch this world? God, would you send a revival? Start with me, Lord. When you get to the end of yourself, that's when God begins to work in the most dynamic way. So simply ask him. Bring it to the Lord in prayer. Just say, God, I so desperately need you. I can't do this without you. But God, I need a move of God in my family, my home, my marriage. God responds when people pray and they ask. Number two, worship. The Bible says, God, when we worship God in spirit and truth, remember, God is spirit. He helps us in our worship, and he inhabits the praises of his people. I wasn't looking around, but when the worship team said, lift your hands, did you? When we were encouraged to sing, did you? Or were you like this? I'm just telling you, if you're like this, you'll receive less of the intimacy with God. God is everywhere, but we're talking about an intimate relationship with God. If you're in his will and you're asking for prayer, you'll see God move in ways you never would have thought. If you worship, it brings an intimacy into your life. Here's the th third thing. Walk by faith. Walk by faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. You say, what is faith? Faith is just taking God at his word and obeying it even if you don't understand it. So if God tells you to tithe fully the gross, you say, God, I don't know how this is gonna work. Yeah, you don't know how it's gonna work, but you obey God by faith. And then once you start there, say, okay, God asks you to give to missions, a faith promise. You say, Oof. God has me going from 100 to 250. I don't know how we're gonna do this. But because God said so, I'll obey the Lord. Remember Jesus, they were fishing all night. Jesus comes to them. But Lord, we've been fishing all night. Jesus said, throw your, throw your net on the other side. But Lord, we've been fishing all night. But because you say so, because you said it, you understand where the fish are, you created everything. Because you say so, there was such a large gathering of fish that had to call the other guys to help them come. It's only because God says so. And the Bible says God rewards those who will walk by faith. If you say, well, I'm just kind of living, man. I'm just doing my thing, man. Yeah, yeah, God calls us to live by faith. Without faith, it's impossible. Please, God, say, God, I'm walking by faith. I'm just telling you right now, my wife and I, and by the way, 29 years tomorrow. Come on, somebody. <laughs> We're walking by faith. We haven't arrived. We've arrived in Christ, but we have not gotten to heaven. And so as long as we're here on earth, we're lifting up our hands to God and say, God, we need you. Move by the Spirit. Whatever you tell us to do, Lord, we're willing to do whatever you want us to do, God. If you want us to go up to Valesburg every single Sunday night by faith, even when nothing's happening, God, we will obey you by faith because you said to do it. If you tell us to give this much, we'll do it. We dedicate our kids at the altar, Lord, we'll do it. When you say yes to Jesus, 
You walk by faith because you don't understand where it's all going. You probably don't have all the money, but God is faithful. We must trust God more than what our minds can wrap around. We walk and trust him. Number four, be a witness for Jesus Christ. Share the message of Christ. We have these invitation cards. Use them, they're in the lobby, bring them with you. Take a picture, scan it, give it to your friends. Don't hold it out. I said, not only do I pastor, like I preach, and that's great, but I wanna be a witness in my neighborhood. And I, we, had a, we had an ex experience this past week, my wife and I, we, we went to the kettle and the grill. Everyone, everyone been to the kettle and grill on the other side of Marlton? And there was a lady in our church. Well, let me say it. There's a lady came up. It was the waitress. She goes, this is what she said. She goes, are you the minister of that church? Most people don't call like minister. They just call me like Pastor John. I, I told you, I love when they call me Big Papa, but they, they don't know. 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 The lady goes, are you the minister at church? She goes, this. I've never been into a church like that before. She goes, the hairs on my arm were standing up the whole time. And she goes, I'm gonna come back next week. And so we we're just talking for a minute. She goes, yeah, I got invited by somebody from our church. It's actually, I don't mean to embarrass, there's a young lady, is it in our church? I don't wanna embarrass her, but she's sitting right there. Um, <laughs> Danny, you invited, and, you're, and you're, is it your aunt or your god aunt? Am I saying that? Your godmother something, right? Godmother, godmother, and her name is Patty, but they call her Pab Pabo. So we, we, Miriam and I, we got so excited. We got so excited that a young lady on fire for Jesus on the front row invited her God aunt or whatever, and we're sitting there like, all right, you came, you come to our church for the first time. You loved it. You never heard about it before. And there was a young lady who's in high school that invited you to church. You know what she said? She goes, yeah, my, my aunt, or my niece, God niece, whatever. <laughs> you guys have a whacked out family. All right, anyway. <laughs> she goes, yeah, my niece invited me, and I love my niece. And whatever my niece would ask, I would definitely do it. So Miriam and I were so excited. We're so proud. Like, you know, it's great. Everybody, people. When you invite people, when you're a witness, it does something, and there's a closeness, because that's what God does. He comes to seek and to save that which is lost. If you want God to be close to you, be an inviter. You'll, you'll, you'll be kind of like doing what God's will is. This is what we should be doing, not talking about what we should be doing. So Miriam and I, we got so excited. But I, did I tell you? We're celebrating 29 years tomorrow. Come on. Did I tell you that already? I can't even remember. Thank you. We take cards, mostly gift cards. Venmo, too. What do we do, Miriam? Just, can you just give us, put, up, put on the screen all the invitation. Venmo, cash app. And so we got so excited, we went back two days later to Kettle on the Grill. You know what I said? I said, I want to sit by Patty's, Patty's booth. You should have seen Patty come around the corner. Not you guys again. <laughs> and she didn't know our name. So we had entered John and Miriam, and she goes, you know, they call me Patty, but... How people really call me is Pabo. And it touched our hearts. I'm proud of you. But if you want to have God closer to you, invite people, not just the church, but talk about the Lord. Be his witness. See, God's spirit is everywhere, but you want this intimate relationship with him. You got to ask him for a stronger relationship. Talk to him about everything in your life. Worship him. Like worship him in spirit and truth for God inhabits the praises. Live by faith. Trust God. His word is bigger than your thoughts. Walk by faith and witness for him. Here's the fifth one. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. You heard me say every believer has the spirit of God in them. But there's another movement of the Holy Spirit. It's called spirit baptism or baptism of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus resurrected, the Bible says he breathed in them. And that's when they became Christians. The Spirit of God came in them. Acts chapter 2, when he was starting the church. And by the way, today, it almost seems like we don't need this. But Jesus said, this is how life should be. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, says the Spirit of God came upon them. And they all began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God enabled them as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. There was fire that came upon them. So I, I did something this past week that I kind of regret, but have you ever 
You know when you have weeds in your driveway and the cracks and stuff, you get like the weed killer? I guess weed killer's not really good for you, right? So they had this advertise. You could have a propane tank and you have this torch. I was going to bring it to church today because I thought this is going to be a good illustration. The kids on the front row, I, sin- I can singe their things right there. They'll never forget this illustration. So I'm kind of, I got this torch. I'm like getting everything. And I'm doing all the weeds. I love it. All of a sudden, I got a little too close to the bush. I started burning up my landscape stuff. It's going billows of smoke. Little kids were driving their bike, and I could see them going faster. Like, I got to go tell my dad. I got to go tell my dad. I was burning, and there was this tree. I almost burned down the neighborhood. But that torch is so cool, man. You know, some people, when it comes to, like, the power of God's spirit, they make a mess with it. They blow stuff up. But when the spirit of God comes upon your life and empowers you, you're not doing this alone. Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Men, you are not on this planet to pay bills for your kids. You're on this planet to glorify God, to obey him, and God to use you to to reach a lost and a dying world. You can't do this in your own ability. God said he will empower you. But also behind the scenes, behind the scenes, there's a benefit of being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Verse 4 says, he who prays in tongues He edifies himself. There's a closeness to God. When your spirit built, and by the way, you can have as much of God as you want. You say, I haven't had this experience. I know what you're talking about. You're the pastor. You're ordained. No, no. This is for all people. God will be so close to you when you pray in the spirit. And you can pray in the spirit like all the time. This is a gift that God has for believers, not to divide the church, but America needs the power of God. It doesn't need something out of control and angry. It needs God. You know what my friends from Indonesia said? When you walk around the streets in Indonesia, you could feel, you could sense spiritual stuff everywhere, spiritual warfare. You could see the witch doctor. You could see, you could see people like demonic. You could see it. He goes, you're not scared that like someone's going to jump on you with demons. It's more sad that a demon has control of somebody and just destroying their life. But you can feel feel it. He goes, when we come home to America, that same spirit is around. It's just hidden. And it's convincing people that you don't need God because, you know, we have a decent school system. So, hey, we got to get our kids to get educated. That becomes the number one thing. But if you look behind education, what they're trying to do to indoctrinate our kids, that's evil. They say, when where we are, we have to believe God for miracles, for healing, because the medical is not as good. But in America, you have great doctors and hospitals. But if you look behind it, it's not all good. Everywhere in America just tells you you don't need God. But there's a huge spiritual warfare that's happening for the souls, especially for the souls of young people today. We don't need God. We don't need church but it's not working for us behind the scenes. And Satan, who is in charge of the air that we breathe out there, he's in control of the Hollywood, he's in control of the airways, the the push behind the scenes, it's satanic. And what happens is when a spirit-filled believer, you can see it clearly, this is not of God, this is not good. And God's spirit's upon us, leading us, guiding and piercing the darkness. And it becomes so obvious. It's like someone turns on the light on a daily. And you say, I want that. I want God's spirit on me and through me as I. You businessmen, listen, you need God's spirit. Not everybody you jump in business with is good. There's behind the scenes stuff. Where does that money flow? What's behind? We need God like never before and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we simply say, God's Holy Spirit, fall upon me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Let me speak in tongues, not to say I'm special, but God, because I want you to control my life. And there is an intimacy with Jesus as we're spirit-filled in Jesus' name.
I actually believe there's a huge spiritual fight that's coming in the next six months in America, and I don't know what it is. But I, pray, I, I believe that if we're spirit-filled, full of God, God will give us the victory in Jesus' name. I do want to walk you through a couple things. I, I call this phase three of where we're at. Before COVID, I, well, let me say this. During COVID, I felt like God said, I'll build my church. You heard me say this. We had plans. We had the plans all done to improve the sanctuary to look like this. Everything needed to be modernized, the restrooms, the lobby. Everything looks great. We're so blessed. But COVID happened, and we were just kind of like, okay. I just felt like the Lord said, I'll build my church. Just wait on me. I'll build it. And I've been a pastor long enough. I know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take offerings and, hey, we've got to get new air conditioning, $50,000. Everybody gives an extra $100. We do it, and, hey, that's, what, that's how you do it. I feel like God says it's going to be different. You're in COVID, and you can't do anything. You're going to have to trust me. You walk with God, and you're going to see God move. And then all of a sudden, Valesburg popped up, and we renovated Valesburg first. We took care of God's building. We got a, it still needs to be updated constantly, but... We obeyed the Lord by saying, okay, God, we're going to walk by faith. And we took care of Valesburg. You took care of Valesburg. Some of you do real well in life. You're up there. You're painting. you got people on, make a lot of money. Engineers, doctors, you're painting. You're doing manual labor for the glory of God. I believe God honors that. And all of a sudden, God allowed us to build this building by faith. Now it's phase one. Phase two, I think we just came out of phase two. I believe God says, I'm developing the people. I was like, okay, what does that mean? Well, it's it's a changing, it's evolving congregation. You're going to grow back. You're going to grow back numerically past where you were pre-COVID. Actually, if you look at it from my point of view, I could do great things in your life in this church if you'll just follow me. Just keep your eyes on me. And so you see an evolving congregation. Most churches in America are, are evolving some of the main people aren't here anymore and all these new people are coming. We had to disciple people. We went to a new system of leadership, you know, elders, deacons. And by the way, we're having a deacon information meeting in October. You can look for that. A staff had to evolve, congregation, elders, deacons. And I feel like we're now in phase three and I feel like God says, you're gonna see something you've never seen before. You're gonna see a, a, a mighty move of God. I believe it's of the spirit. In my, in my mind, I still feel like, you know, I'm kind of like most people think about finances. I feel like God says, I'm going to take care of the finances. I'm going to bless this place. I'm going to shock you. I'm going I'm to take care of it. I don't know if you know the story, but I, I was invited to a graduation party. I think the people might be upstairs. They invited me from here. It's about an hour away. There was a, we got there early, too. It was a, it was a backyard party for a graduate from high school. And we were, we were like an hour early because we were coming from somewhere and we saw this big, like, amusement thing. Come to find out it was a place called Cowtown. Has anyone heard of Cowtown? I felt like I was down in Mississippi. I was like, what is, this is New Jersey? New Jersey. They had a rodeo and all these people. Miriam and I were just trying to, like, we were inner city Newark for, like, 13 years. We actually feel more comfortable. Oh, that's just a gunshot. These people, like, what is going on? And, like, we're just walking, my wife and I. By the way, we're going to be married 29 years tomorrow. Come on, somebody. We were walking. And I, back then I had a Yankee, Yankee hat on. And there was a guy in a golf cart. I guess he was like security or whatever. He was making sure the cows didn't get into fights down there, cow town. There was a guy, and he was on a, a golf cart. He, wa- he went right in front of us. He turned to us and slammed on the brakes. He goes, you like the Yankees? He had a Yankee hat. I said, yeah, you know what I mean? I used to love sports. That used to be my God. He said, yeah. He goes, I got something for you. And he starts like rummaging through like in the golf cart thing. And by the way, I think there's going to be golf carts in heaven. I love golf carts. Do you? I see these guys, like, they're walking, playing golf. Are you kidding me? You get to have a golf cart? It's like the best thing in the world. He's, got, he's going through it, and he whips out this wallet. He has the Yankees on it. I felt like God spoke to me. I'm going to meet all of your needs. And I was just like any human being. I started going through. I'm like, well, there's the money for the new building program in here. Nope. Just have this in my drawer, have it. 
It was for me. Because I could say, God, you're going to ask me to stand before a congregation and to build a sanctuary by faith. It should be about three and a half million dollars, but it's going to jump to five and a half million. That's going to make sense for them. Like, how are we going to pay it? Oh, just tell them I'll do it. Yeah, but what happens if they don't believe me? Oh, yeah, we're going to do Valesburg first, but they don't, they're not even connected to Valesburg. They don't know Valesburg. And when I left Valesburg, I was happy to leave Valesburg. My, my heart really wasn't there. God said, will you just obey me? Will you just trust me? Because you'll see my hand move like you've never seen it before. What we're seeing God do right now in the church is absolutely amazing. We built this, or God built this. Our school is brimming. Valesburg is doing well. God, and I just feel like God says, you're in this moment of spiritual fervency. I'm going to bless it, and everyone's going to know that I am God. And during this time, you know, I was thinking about God, I just don't want to be embarrassed. God never wants to embarrass people. He just wants people to say yes to him and to glorify him. And when you say, God, I just want all that you have, I put you first in my life, it begins to do something in you and the atmosphere around you when you trust the Lord. The Bible says that God is going to do a greater work. Will you believe with me that God is going to do a greater work in September, October, November, and December? God will send a revival of his Holy Spirit. It won't be from the witch doctor. It will be of the Holy Spirit moving in us and through us. Zachariah said it like this. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. It's not by might nor by power. It's by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. I believe God is getting us ready because he is omnipresent. He will look for people who will say yes to God. They'll lift up their hands and respond in faith. And so, by the way, when you respond in faith, you say, why do I tell you to come to the altar? You can pray at your seat. God is present there, but when you combine your faith with your feet and you say, God, you got all of me, that's when God begins to work deep in your heart. I want to invite you to come to the prayer service on September 11th. I want to encourage you to draw near to God. I want to with your mind, with your heart, with your body, with your money, with your whole being, saying, God, I belong to you. I want a movement of God's spirit in my life. I believe God wants to do it. I believe God wants to send a revival to the nation, but he wants to start in my life. He wants to start in Marlton. He wants to start in Valesburg and the state of New Jersey. I believe God is up to something, but we just have to say, God, we need all of your spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. I will obey you in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me in God's presence? I preach way too long, but it was good, if you know I have it. God is at work in my life. I'm on my knees praying for people I've never met. Because the world needs Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about my preferences. Politics frustrate me. I get angry about it. I don't know why the turn off to me, but God cares about people. And I believe God wants to do something with young people. I believe God wants to do something with inner city people. I believe God wants, he cares about the poor. The way the economy's going, we have to take care of the poor. God will bless us. He will bless this congregation so much so we have extra to be a blessing to the world. This church matters to God. The ministry coming out of this will be a difference maker for New Jersey. Your life matters for God. And we're going to sing, don't you tell me he can't do it. If you want God to move upon your life, you must ask him. You, you might need to surrender yourself. Say, God, move upon my life. Ask him. Receive. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, begin to worship him and praise him. God, fill me. Don't resist him. When God asks you to obey him, don't really just walk and obey him. You'll see God. He's waiting for people to respond to him in Jesus' name. We are primed. We are a prayerful church. We're a worshiping church. But I believe our best days in this new year are right ahead of us. If you want God to move in your life in a greater way, I invite you to come around this altar. Let's sing it together. Let's believe together. Oh, Jesus is faithful. He's so good. Come on, let's believe God for his goodness. Don't you tell me he can do it. We've seen cancer disappear. We've seen broken bodies heal. Don't you tell me he can do it. Don't you tell me he can do it. We'll see real life resurrection. We'll see mental health restored. Don't you tell me he can do it. Don't you tell me. We'll see family 
God works in the modern world is by his spirit. Jesus is in heaven and he, by his spirit, draws us. When we're wrong, he convicts us, saying that's wrong. He assures us that we're his. He teaches us. He's the advocate. He's present in all of our lives. We're equal before him. But not all people respond to his will. I didn't say, do you believe in God? To his will. If you want God to move in your life, especially as we come into this new September, October, moms and dads, pray God's spirit would be all over your kids at school. They would know the truth. They would understand and make good decisions and choices. Ask God to pour out his spirit on them. In the last days, God says he's going to pour out his Holy Spirit on all flesh. I believe God is wanting to do something upon the flesh, but really what it comes down to is people that will ask him in his will and say, God, I want all that you have for me. And what our job is just to respond to him. I know this is terrible to say this, but during COVID, I said, God, am I the right person to lead Marlton? Because God, I don't really need all this. People are fighting and angry with each other and the governor and PPP money and this and this. And I was like, oh dear God, I'm not sure if I'm equipped for that. I said, no, I want you to obey me. You're not alone. You don't have to fear. I'm with you, okay? Lord, we're gonna move forward in Jesus' name. What the Lord has done for us and through us for his glory is absolutely amazing. But I feel like God has something better. He wants us to move forward in his name. I believe he's going to help us to pay off the rest of the debt. I told you last week, I've been saying it's 1.72 we have to pay, right? It's down to 1.69. Come on, somebody. It doesn't seem like a lot, but the sixes sound better than the sevens. It's not the money. It's God moving in us and through us for his glory. He wants to bless us with his presence. He wants to be close to us. He wants his people not to fear and anxiety. He doesn't want our kids to be all whacked out. No, but we lift our hands to God and say, God, we trust you. You'll get us through and we'll be victorious. God, you are faithful. You're good. And it's just a different day. How God's going to work is just going to be different. I believe when it happens, we'll all say, hey, we've been talking about this. We have a good God. We can trust him. And let's keep pressing and let's keep worshiping. Let's keep, I believe God is shifting. We need to respond in Jesus' name. If you want God to move in your life, in your home, maybe your ministry, your business, in your children's life, Maybe you're sensing something about the future. You don't know. You don't have to figure it out. Just, if you, you're, you're yeah, Pat, I agree with you. Yeah, it, it, this is a weird day, but God has something else for us. If you want God to move upon your life, your situation in a greater way, would you just lift up your hands like this to the Lord? 
Heavenly Father, we come into this place. We've worshiped you. We've prayed. We've heard your word. And God, you said it's not by might nor by power, but it's by your spirit. We know that you're everywhere. Theologically, we know that you're everywhere. But because you're here, we draw near to you. We ask. We worship. Lord God, we walk by faith. We lift up our voice and we share the message of Christ. We prioritize with the Spirit of God upon us and in us. Lord, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, if there's something that doesn't belong, we confess it, we repent of it, and we focus our attention, our priorities on Jesus Christ and his will for our life. Lord, I pray, Lord, whatever you want for our life, we will say yes to you today, tomorrow, this week. We will obey you. We'll trust you, oh God. We'll seek first the kingdom and we'll store up treasures in heaven. Fill us with the Holy Ghost. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with your power. God, give us clarity of mind. Take away drugs and alcohol and pornography. Lord, let our minds be on you. God, fill us with worship. Fill us with your power. God, I pray upon your people online, in person, Pastor Curlin, God, we need you like never before. Prepare us for the future, we pray. In Jesus' name, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you. We have National Night Out on Tuesday. We'll see you next Sunday. Hey, thanks for being in church. We have just finished a giant sprint of these filmed over one, like what, how long did this take us? 15? Cool 15? What? Cool 15. We filmed all of these sum this summer. So thanks for being part of this magical journey. We'll see you soon.